My name is Brad Potter, and as head of the Department of Accounting, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the 2021 CPA Australia University of Melbourne Annual Research Lecture. It's a shame that due to COVID-19, we're not able to safely come together to celebrate on campus, but welcome nonetheless to our second online and COVID safe version of the event. I think we're all grateful for having access to the technology that allows us to deliver the event virtually. Before I go any further, I'd like to acknowledge that the land on which the university stands and where this event would normally take place is the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who have been coming together to share knowledge, understanding and share experiences for more than 40,000 years. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and pay my respects to their elders past and present. A special welcome to CPA Australia Board Directors and CEO who are watching the event tonight. Merrin Council, President and Chairman of the Board, Peter Wilson, Director and Immediate Past President, Professor Dale Pinto, Deputy President, Helen Lorrigan, Louise Cox and Rosemary Sinclair, Directors, and Andrew Hunter, CEO, welcome. Watching this event also are colleagues from far afield and across industry and the academe. We have students and staff from the university and friends and colleagues at other universities members of CPA Australia and of the profession, as well as the general public, welcome to you. There is a significant number of continuous lecture series, not only at the university, but also internationally, and this is the longest running. The first of this lecture series was presented by Sir Alex Fitzgerald in 1940. As many of you will know, Sir Alex was a pioneer in accounting education and research and was the second to serve in the role of Head of Department of Accounting at the University of Melbourne. His brother Garrett was also a key figure in accounting and a, prof a professorial chair in the department now bears their name. This is a really nice background to this year's speaker who actually held the Fitzgerald Chair of Accounting prior to her retirement earlier this year. Personally, I'm really thrilled that Anne Lillis, Professor Emerita, will present the lecture this year for a few reasons. Not only has she been an absolute leader internationally in her field for many years, She's been a most valued department colleague and someone with whom I've had the pleasure to work with for more than 25 years. In a slight break from tradition, I won't proceed to a formal intro for Anne at this point, but we'll invite Maggie Abernathy, Professor Emerita, to do the honours. As many of you will know, Maggie is also an international leader in education and research in her field and has been a long-time close colleague and friend of Anne until her retirement also from the university at the end of 2020. Together, Maggie and Anne have provided significant leadership in management, accounting, education and research for a number of decades, and it's only fitting for Maggie to introduce Anne. Quick matter of housekeeping before we commence. During the lecture, you can submit your questions by using the Q&A tool in the Zoom webinar. Select questions will be responded to by Anne during the live Q&A component following the lecture. That's it from me for now. Over to you, Maggie. Thank you, Brad. It is an absolute delight and honor to introduce Professor Anne Lillis for tonight's lecture. Anne and I have known each other for almost 40 years since we were tutors at La Trobe University. And then we both finished our careers here at Melbourne earlier this year. We have researched together, we have taught together, we've supervised students together, had children together, and most important, we've had a lot of fun. I have the highest respect for Anne as an academic. She is a brilliant teacher and leading international researcher. This lecture is never easy for an academic as we are speaking to practitioners and the general public. Often researchers find it difficult to link their research to problems of practice, but Anne will have no difficulty. Ever since I have known her, she has studied risky, messy problems that industry faces and ones that are relevant to industry. I recall her master's thesis, which was based on a conundrum she came across when she was teaching. Most textbooks say that ROI, return on investment, is a poor measure of manager performance and that it will lead to underinvestment. And yet, when you look at practice, many firms use ROI. Anne set out to solve this conundrum, and it has sparked much of her work in the years to come. 
She is now internationally recognized for her work on performance measurement, incentive systems, and costly systems. Her work has always been published in highly influential journals. Much of this work has been based on field research, which is extremely time consuming and a relatively high risk strategy for getting published in the top journals. But she has never wavered in her desire to solve problems that were relevant. And her research has always been published in those influential journals. Only this year, she had two publications accepted for publication in the top international accounting journal. Her significant contribution to research has been recognized numerous times. She received the Dean's Prize for Exceptional Distinction in Research and Research Training. She's an editor on a major journal on editorial boards of international journals, been invited to deliver plenary addresses around the world. And her research has been recognized when she was admitted as a fellow to the Academy of Social Sciences. But what is unusual about Anne's contribution to the Academy is, in addition to being an exceptional researcher, she has always been a passionate teacher. You will see that on display tonight. Anne's research and teaching are symbiotic. Her teaching informs her research and her research is integrated into her teaching. Anne challenged tired teaching conventions in the department and was instrumental in introducing case-based teaching in seminars to replace lectures in the early 2000s. This was novel and innovative in accounting education at the time. And taught across and influenced the delivery of all subjects in the management accounting program, bringing innovation and active mentoring to junior faculty. In 2020, Anne's contribution to teaching was recognized by the faculty when she received the career achievement in teaching. Anne has also provided significant leadership in the department as head of department, deputy head, and program director. She is an excellent role model and support for junior faculty. I could continue at great length about Anne's many achievements and contributions. But I'll pass you over to Anne for her to present the CP annual lecture titled, Rewarding What You Can Count or Rewarding What Counts? What Firms Do to Mitigate Adverse Incentive-Driven Behavior. The lecture will be closed by CPA President Jackie Briggs. Please enjoy Anne's lecture. Thank you, Brad and Maggie, for those very warm and generous introductions. We do indeed go a long way. And thank you to CPA Australia and the University of Melbourne Department of Accounting for inviting me to deliver this lecture this evening. I, I feel incredibly honoured to join such a prestigious list of presenters of this historic lecture series. Also, thank everybody for tuning in tonight. I know that uh, we're all heartily sick of Zoom, so I really do appreciate you taking the time and effort to tune in. Tonight, I, I want to talk about the thorny problem of performance measurement and incentives. Performance measurement and reward systems are a critical part, potentially the most pivotal part of an organisation's control system. The approach a firm takes to performance uh, measurement and reward can have profound effects on firm performance, on the motivation of their managers, and on the actions and decisions that managers take on behalf of the firm. It's an area where I've spent a career researching, uh, and tonight I just want to take you through some findings and insights from a large-scale field study that I've recently conducted on this topic. So by way of our, firstly, just going to go through the way I see the problem of performance-based pay. I'm then going to talk about this field study that I'm drawing on. Um, and basically what we focused on was subjective performance measurement. And I want to talk about how that fits within a pay for performance model and how it kind of changes the orientation of this notion of pay for performance. 
Uh, and then I'm going to conclude by talking about the type of contracts that we saw in these firms underpinning their performance measurement and reward practice, and in particular, the role of relational contracts. Now, I will at various stages during this talk ask what could go wrong, you know, as I talk through the evolution of some of the performance measurement practices in these firms. And it turns out most firms are on a journey and uh, it's kind of one step forward, two steps back. Uh, whatever we choose to do in this performance measurement and reward space always tends to have significant downsides, which we'll also look at. Okay, the, the thorny problem of performance-based pay. Well, performance-based pay is ubiquitous and very much taken for granted. Most firms offer some sort of performance-based pay to their managers. And World at Work and Compensationary Advisory Partners do an annual survey in the US. They claim that at least 76% of private companies and 89% of public companies incentivise employees using short-term incentives based on explicit annual performance targets. Now, that's things like uh, sales targets, uh, market share, cost reduction targets, and so forth. Hard, usually financial targets that are the basis of uh, performance-based pay. What's the rationale for this? Well, it's very well-intentioned. You know, the idea is that you set the performance expectations um, and you those expectations reflect what you want people to do and you reward the achievement. And, and that's... Uh, pretty much the, the foundation of performance-based pay. So what could go wrong? Well, it turns out that a lot can go wrong. We've seen, these are the kind of cases that hit the front page of the newspaper. We've had Metro in trouble for short running trams and trains uh, and trains skipping stations to meet performance benchmarks, particularly scheduled targets. There have been studies of performance pay for teachers, that if you pay teachers for achieving certain um, objective test result outcomes, that tends to backfire. We found that teachers will understandably teach to the test. Um, they also lose motivation, they become more stressed, and it's even less hours, so fewer hours, uh, and with less, less enthusiasm. Where I guess it was really noticeable, uh, and uh, most people would identify with this, is the what we found through the bank, uh, Banking Royal Commission, the egregious behaviours that have been occurring in the banks uh, as a result of these uh, revenue targets and sales targets that, um, that bankers faced. Uh, setting up fake accounts, selling pro uh, inappropriate products to people just to meet their um, performance targets and earn bonuses. Similarly, we saw the same thing in Wells Fargo in the US. Uh, another one that I think really caught the public imagination was the police, the Victoria Police, breath testing themselves in order to meet their testing targets. Um, uh, and that was a kind of a bit of a tricky one uh, for people to, uh, to get their heads around why the police would do that. We've even had the Australian Taxation Office in the firing line for setting revenue targets, which has led to unfair treatment of small businesses. Uh, and targeting of small businesses. So clearly a lot can go wrong. These are all incentive-driven behaviours. So at around this time, I, I really like this article written by Anna Patty in the Sydney Morning Herald in 2018. And she asks the question, why did they do it? She talks about the cult of the KPI and how it's damaged our moral compass. She was focused particularly on uh, Commonwealth Bank employees setting up fake accounts, etc., and also the police breath testing themselves and just asking, why did they do it? The answer to the why question really comes out to be they basically did what they were asked to do in the sense that they were given performance benchmarks and they uh, tried to meet them. They met them in inappropriate ways, but basically they did just they tried to do what they were told to do. So is this just evidence of greed or mischief? Or it's not quite that simple. You know, people respond just as strongly to badly designed incentives as they do to well-structured ones. You know, these performance measures are supposed to capture the underlying goals of organisations. You know, yes, we do want trams to run on time. And yes, we do want police to, to achieve a certain level of productivity with their uh, roadside testing. These are the underlying goals, but our measures don't 
uh, capture particularly well those underlying goals. Performance measures then signal to employees what's important. So the question becomes how can firms define and measure exactly what they want employees to do? And it turns out that's really challenging. Um, you know, we, they've tried it. If, if they want, if you want different outcomes, we change the measures. So, for example, uh, they tried this with Metro. They added a customer service metric, but of course, the penalties for uh, not meeting the customer service requirement were less than the bonus to be achieved by running on time. So it didn't stop the short running trams, etc. Uh, they also tried it with the banks. They implemented a customer service metric. Um, and, and so what we found happened was that, the, that they, they used a, um, the number of customer needs assessments that had been completed as their measure. And so we were all hounded by banks trying to assess our needs and sell us insurance. Uh, so the dysfunctional behaviour continued. It just transferred from one measure to another. So the problem is quite challenging at a fundamental level. It's not simply solved by changing the metrics. So we went out into the field to have a look at performance measurement practice. So with my two co-authors, Mary Malina from the US and Julia Mundy in the UK, we went to study uh, the role of subjectivity in performance measurement systems. Now, what we take away from that study is actually more than what we set out to, to look at. And our motivation wasn't really the question that I've started with in this lecture. Uh, the motivation was really around studying subjectivity, but it's taken us into this realm of thinking quite deeply about uh, the, way, uh, the way firms avoid these dysfunctional behaviours. Um, with incentive contracting. So we did 38 interviews with, uh, at a manager level, so these were not junior employees, they were at manager level across four large firms, two in manufacturing, two in investment, uh, one in investment management and one professional services firm. Uh, and we were particularly focused on the way they, um, on their measure, measure performance. Now I'm gonna talk about sub subjective performance measurement for a little while. And then I'll come back to how, uh, why this is important in this kind of pay for performance model. Okay, so what we found. So all four firms adopted multiple objective and subjective measures for each managerial role. Uh, they, even their subjective measures were deliberately smart. So where they wanted to have measures of things like leadership uh, and teamwork, they set, set those measures to be deliberately smart, that is specific, measurable, actionable, realistic and time bound. Uh, so they tried very hard to make their performance measurement as objective and explicit as possible. Bonus schemes were represented to us as relatively formulaic. So in the firm that I was in, there were three components to the, uh, to the bonus formula, the firm level performance, business level, and uh, individual performance all had multiple measures within them. They formed three brackets. There was a multiplier attached to each bracket and, out, and it was a mathematical, the foot bonus was a mathematical result of the application of that formula. So this looked pretty much like we expected to see. This is the way we understand incentive contracting in practice. However, what we found when we dug into things further was that there were layers of subjectivity impacting almost all elements of the formula, everything except the firm performance part, which was um, basically set the, the bonus pool uh, magnitude. Uh, so the important part of this was a subjective overlay, overlay assessing how pre-specified performance outcomes were achieved. So they had objective measures, but they were also assessed on how they achieved those objective outcomes. The weighting on the objective of what they achieved, the specific outcomes and the how, the behavioural assessments, was also discretionary. So it turned out that we would not have been able to even determine how much of their bonus was determined subjectively and how much was objective. So they, you know, this, this is important for what comes later. So while they had all these objective measures, they were also assessed on, on, on the how. So the firm looked into the behaviours that managers adopted to achieve their performance outcomes to make sure that they weren't just gaming the metrics, etc. So 
what appeared to be the case here was that the bonus and effort relationship appeared unpredictable to an employee. Like they wouldn't be able to determine exactly what their bonus was going to be from the performance uh, outcomes that they achieved because of this subjective overlay that had to occur afterwards. Now, the literature would tell us that that would increase compensation risk uh, and compensation costs, but that's not actually what we find. So, are these findings unusual? Well, they are. And I think you probably recognise some aspects of this uh, in firms that you've worked in or that you are working in. You know, these are four very different large firms operating, you know, in different countries, uh, in different industries. And they also have quite different formal presentation of their performance measurement and reward system. But they were remarkably, had remarkably common features when we dug into them. Now, both the accounting literature acknowledges that subjective performance measurement is very prevalent and and compensation partners survey uh, also acknowledges that with 73% of respondents indicating there's some subjectivity um, in the application of annual incentive plans. So not only is objective explicit performance measurement uh, and performance-based pay um, ubiquitous, so is subjectivity. And so it's a matter of kind of figuring out how they make this work. And what we're able to do in our field study, I think, is find is get a deeper insight into how the firms are using subjectivity and why they're using it and you know, where it manifests, it manifests in the performance measurement and reward process. Interestingly, no one in our field studies talked about compensation risk or high compensation as a result of the level of subjective assessments and the unpredictability uh, of pay. So why was there such a subjective overlay? Well, they clearly relied a lot on objective measures as you know, they were clearly at the core of the performance measurement and reward system. But they distrusted the signal that came from those objective measures. They recognised that they were incomplete in capturing everything that they wanted their managers to do. They were static. That is, they needed people to be able to adapt when circumstances changed, and these performance measures were, were static. They were also potentially optimised by employees, subordinates engaging in behaviours that were not in the firm's best interests, as we've seen uh, in the prior examples. So they recognised these risks in their performance measurement system. And so that's why they layered this subjectivity over the top. And as one manager says, you're going for pure performance metrics, you lose the view of how people are behaving to deliver their work plan. Somebody may do it at the expense of everyone else in the company, especially stuff that encourages collaboration, information sharing and development of others. The, those elements can just not, cannot be measured that easily. So they then trusted their, their subjective assessments um, more highly uh, to motivate, uh, to assess and to motivate the right behaviours. So thinking about then how this works in a pay for performance model. Well, there are two key purposes for subjectivity in the case study firms. The first is goal alignment, and that's kind of what we've just been talking about. Um, so they want to make sure that employees are making the right decisions and behaving in ways that add value to the firm in the broad sense of the word. But they don't want employees just out focused on meeting the metrics. They didn't trust the hard metrics to elicit the decisions and actions that they wanted from managers. So subjectivity, one of the key purposes was to try and ensure that people actually focused on the underlying goals, not just the metrics. The second element of it is to what we call uh, facilitate what we call employee sorting, which is ensuring that the right employees are identified for reward, retention and promotion. Now, this turns out to be more important than single period bonuses. And the thing is that the same performance measurement system is used both for giving bonuses, but also it is the means by which you assess people's performance and rate them, rank them in, within the firm. So if you reward the wrong people, if you reward the people who are gaming the metrics, you're probably also going to retain and promote the wrong people as well. The firm wants to reward and promote the institution builders, the people who make, who, who guarantee the long-term value of the firm, the future leaders, and they feel they can really do that subjectively. 
So as one manager notes, you know, there's more of a tendency to downrate than overrate because of the consequences. If you overrate somebody because they achieve the, the objective metrics and they're promoted, you know, people are very concerned about that. They are on the side of caution and tend to underrate. You know, they're much more concerned about um, promoting the wrong people than they are about single period bonuses. So thinking about this further in a, in a pay for performance model, we talked earlier about the fact that defining performance is important. Now what's happening in these firms is that they're defining performance conditionally. So it matters what managers do, that is the outcomes that they achieve, but it also matters how they do it. And the, the payoff and, and you know, whether they do it consistently with firm values and collaboratively and all that, with a view to the future and all that sort of thing. So the payoff uh, is not just in bonuses, it's also in the future with the firm. So the payoff for employees in terms of doing the right thing is not just in terms of immediate bonuses, but in their future with the firm, because this also underpins the way they're assessed for promotion, etc. But is it that straightforward? You know, subjectivity is not generally considered to be an answer to anything. Subjective assessments are typically biased and error prone. People are prone to leniency in subjective assessments. They're, uh, they're prone to accusations of favouritism. Uh, you can invest a lot of time and effort in subjective judgments and everybody ends up being rated above expectations. You know, there are all of these biases and inconsistencies between one period and the next and one manager and the other. Um, and human beings overall are not reliable subjective judges. So we were surprised at the level of subjectivity in this perform these performance measurement and reward systems. So the next question really is how do they make it work? This is where we come to the nature of the contracts that we have a performance measurement and reward practice. Now, typically, performance-based pay is, as we've noted before, based on explicit contracts. Performance measures, targets, bonus potential are explicit and formulaic. You know, that people know very clearly what they need to do uh, to achieve their bonuses. Now, the firms in our study did develop explicit formulaic bonus schemes but then they, then they put this subjective overlay in place uh, so that many of the elements that actually determine bonuses as, are assessed subjectively. The, now, many of the terms of the, effectively, the employees are working under a contract in which many of the terms are implicit and difficult to write in contractual terms. You can't write those behavioural expectations really about adhering to firm values and active, acting collaboratively and um, having a view towards the future. You can't write those into explicit contract terms and yet employees knew they were being assessed on those things. So we refer to these kind of, this notion of contracting in this way with implicit terms as relational contracts. So the relational contracts arise because of the need for adaptive behaviour and the impossibility of completely specifying all contingencies in contracts. And this is kind of what we're observing here, that these firms are saying, we can't anticipate all of the behavioural things that managers might do to achieve their performance outcomes. We can't specify all of the contingencies in explicit contracts. So therefore, we're going to leave the terms implicit. So relational contracts are collaborations sustained by the shadow of the future. And this is an important aspect of it, that both parties stand to lose if the contract breaks down. So what we're observing in these firms is that both employers and employees are going along with a degree of uncertainty about the link between performance and compensation and so forth. Um, and it appears to be this shadow of the future. Both parties stand to lose if the contract breaks down. If, as long as the firm you know, values these behaviours and as long as employees want a future in the firm, then both parties stand to lose if the contract breaks down. So the terms of the, of the contract are implicit, but they seem to be mutually understood by the collaborating parties. Now, an example of relational contracting that might be more um, uh, front of mind is it occurs quite frequently in inter-firm contracts. If we have long-term contracts for, long-term supplier contracts for things like IT, 
marketing, R&D. You know, these strategic alliances uh, in, that firms, the strategic alliances that firms engage in, they're multi-period uh, um, collaborations. Now, in these cases, there is always a contract underpinning these relationships, and quite complex contracts underpinning these relationships. But is it really the contract, the terms of the contract that actually govern behaviour, or is it the, the kind of collaborative spirit that evolves over, over the time in those contracts? I think it's the latter. And, you know, these two terms clearly have a stake in the future, and that stake in the future uh, induces compliance to these unwritten and mutually agreed terms. So, you know, in order for these strategic alliances to adapt over time, um, the firms will they'll communicate with each other. They'll they'll make implicit agreements about what happens if you know if things change, and, and that's what sustains the relationship over time. And in fact, you know, one um, buyer has said to us, you know, once I reach into the drawer to find out what a formal contract actually says, the relationship's finished. So, in other words, the behaviour of the parties is not governed by the formal contract, but by their mutual understanding uh, of the implicit terms and the best ways to make it work. So, we can actually see employment and performance management in a similar way. It is a multi-period game. It's not a one-period, once-off game. Both employers and employees have a joint stake in the future of the firm. Employees want a future in the firm. Employers want to know that they reward and retain their best employees, you know, the people, the, those who contribute long-term value to the business. So in the field study firms, we observe the acceptance of many uncontracted but well understood agreements. It's kind of a form of relational contracting uh, under for, underpinning performance measurement and reward. Uh, in which they say that the employers and employees kind of go along with the idea that they kind of they do understand the terms on which they're operating, even though many of those terms are unwritten. So what can go wrong? Well, it turns out a lot can go wrong. You know, when the terms of contracts are implicit, there's no guarantee that both parties understand them the same way. Uh, and employees don't work on the basis of blind trust in their employer. They don't simply trust their employer to do the right thing. The same as buyers don't trust their suppliers to simply do the right thing and vice versa. These relational contracts can facilitate adaptation and mutual commitment, but they're fragile because they're un unenforceable. It's not about trust. These, these relationships between employers and employees and between buyers and suppliers are calculative. They're definitely not purely based on trust. So how do firms make this work in a performance measurement setting? Well, there are two key pillars that underpin relational contracts. The first is clarity that the promises under the contract are understood. The parties understand the terms of the relational contract. So they might not be written, but they understand the terms. They're clear on performance expectations and how they'll be assessed. And the second is credibility. So the parties to the contract will uphold and act on the terms of the relational contract. That is that while the terms are unwritten, the parties will, once they understand those terms, will act on them as though they were explicitly contracted. So they will uphold and act on the terms of the relational contract. How do the firms then in our case studies, in our case study, guarantee the clarity and credibility of the relational contracts underpinning their performance measurement practice? Well, firstly, with clarity, we were surprised at how clear they were. Without fail, subordinate managers could articulate exactly how their performance was measured and rewarded. They understood the soft criteria. They could tell us what the firm values were and how they were going to be assessed. They could tell us the 11 items that they were going to have to be assessed against for leadership quality. They knew the criteria. They knew how they were being assessed. They had agreed goals, but they knew that they might change. Um, they knew they had to adapt if those goals changed. They knew where the evidence was going to come from to support the subjective assessments. They knew how that evidence was going to be collected. 
They knew there was uncertainty over the reason on how and what, but they, they tolerated that. They talked a lot, and this is interesting, this is the words of the managers, they talked about a culture of no surprises. So communication throughout the performance period meant that there was a culture of no surprises uh, when, they, when it came to the annual performance measurement process and, and bonus uh, determination process. Now, credibility is a bit of a tougher nut to crack um, because, you know, Subject, subjective assessments are never fully transparent and you know employees will often have some concerns about fairness. We tended to find in the firms that we studied that these concerns, there were these concerns at times, but they were relatively muted compared to what we would have expected for the level of subjectivity that we we're observing. So subjective assessments aren't fully transparent, but they can be credible. Now, the first thing that these firms do is rely on evidence-driven assessments. And they utilise the information flows throughout the firm, through supervision, um, through project teams, through cross-functional interdependencies within the firm. They utilise all of that information flow to, to gain information about how people behave to do their work. Uh, and so, as one manager said, the reality is you won't be able to pull the wool over management's eyes or let them have the perception that someone's a really hard worker or a star performer, if in reality he's not. We're all going to find out about it. Um, and the other important piece of this was the use of calibration panels. And this is panels of peers that, uh, that come together to assess the subjective assessments of others. And so they work to standardise assessment benchmarks and to um, uh, make sure that they ch challenge ratings to make sure people are not being lenient with their employees and so forth. They try and weed out the bias. And as the manager said, managers can use as much discretion as they like, but they have to recognise the reality. The calibration will, at the end of the day, catch them out if they want to be irrationally subjective. So there was quite um, a significant kind of infrastructure here um, to... Uh, uh, try and, and avoid the problems with subjective performance measurement. But the main, the main point, the main issue about credibility, the main point at which the rubber hits the road is who gets rewarded, retained and promoted at the end of the day. So uh, is it those that deliver the quantitative outcomes or do the institution builders get rewarded? Does the firm keep its promise to reward the right people? So, you know, do they really, when they come to re reward, retain and promote people, do they genuinely uh, really place a heavy weighting on how people go about their work or do they, do they fall back on um, relying on their quantitative outcomes? There's clearly no point in having this, this complex uh, method of assessing the how and then just re rewarding and retaining and promoting people based on uh, the, their quantitative results. And so uh, if, it's, if it's not upheld at this point, then it will lack credibility and people will clearly revert to just performing to the metrics. So how are these relational contracts viewed by participants? Well, overall, they, they viewed them as being very objective. It's interesting how they said that they were not subjective. They thought they were very objective, and that's largely because of this uh, bureaucratic infrastructure that surrounds the subjective assessments. They thought, well, there are lots of checks and balances. There's lots of transparency. They thought that subjective ratings are juried. They used terms like fairness and controlled discretion. You know, they, even though they couldn't predict their bonus outcome from their performance, they, they felt that they understood the rules of engagement. And, you know, they, they, this calibration was clearly an important part of this. They felt that once the ratings had been calibrated, that, uh, that they were somehow more objective. So uh, cal good calibration was described as the secret source. And, you know, and the employees also know that the firm or felt that the firm had their backs if they made decisions in good faith in the interest of the firm that might not translate into a short term bonus for them. They felt that they that the firm had their backs when they did that. Now, as I said, they, there, there were variations in this thing. This was not, it wasn't universally uh, this good, but it was, these themes were fairly widespread throughout the firms that we study. So what could go wrong? Does it sound too good to be true? What could go wrong? Well, yes, the bureaucratic investment required to build clarity and credibility is all consuming. If you think about the steps in the firms that we study, they started with negotiated targets for each manager. 
They assessed performance twice a year. Every performance metric was assessed in relation to both what's achieved and how it's achieved. In order to support the credibility of those assessments, they had to collect data from throughout the firm. They had to collect data. They had to do 360 degree assessments. They had to collect data from team members, from internal stakeholders, from clients. Um, and then they had calibration panels for every single um, many, every single supervisor effectively had to go to a calibration panel and defend their ratings. So the cal calibration panels check whether uh, supervisors are using consistent benchmarks and they challenge ratings. And then they call for more evidence. So this is huge. This is a huge bureaucratic infrastructure to support the performance measurement and reward system in place. So is it worth it? Well, Several firms have found no, it's not. They've actually, Deloitte actually did the calculations a few years ago and found that it took two million hours a year to determine whether their employees were rated a three or a four. And in the end, they decided that simply wasn't worth it. And a lot of other companies started to uh, abandon the idea of, of uh, this, thinking about the administrative intensity of this, decided to abandon it. But then a lot of others thought, well, actually, no, without that, we can't determine, we actually can't find out who our best employees are. We can't identify the institution builders and the future leaders and so forth. We, we, can't, you know, we run the risk of losing our best employees if we don't have a really strong uh, method of determining um, and rewarding, who, determining who they are and rewarding them appropriately. So firms became a bit divided on this question of whether it's worth it or not. So at the end of the day, it's kind of a trade-off. You know, we can have explicit contracts where we have bonuses and other rewards um, that are, are simply tied to short-term measures. Cheap to run, set and forget. Um, but as we saw, there's potential for dysfunctional decisions. And you do need to ask the question, well, if that's the, make, if that's the, the process in place, who is going to act in the long-term interests of the firm? On the other end of the spectrum, you can have a combination of explicit and implicit contracts, uh, which, as we've seen, is very expensive to run. But you get a much greater opportunity to align goals in the best interest of the organisation. Is the cost too high? Well, if we think of the dysfunctional consequences of the objective performance measures that we saw earlier, and we think about, well, one Royal Commission and a regulatory overhaul later in the banks, I'm not so sure uh, that the uh, that an explicit contracting system is in fact that uh, cheap to run and set and forget. So why is this important and how does it impact what we do? Well, I think we have for too long uh, documented and criticised incentive-driven behaviour. It is a function of performance measurement and reward system design. So to me, the opportunity to observe performance management and reward practices and to talk in depth to high-level managers about why they do what they do was an enormously valuable experience, offering rich and deep insights. Management have a significant role in the design of performance measures that underpin performance contracts. Human resources professionals also have a significant role in the design of performance measurement and reward practice in firms. After observing the practice in these firms, I would argue that jointly, both accountants and human resource pro professionals potentially overvalue the notion of hard targets and objective measures and undervalue the notion of well-informed subjectivity. And then real work will rarely be captured adequately in a hard set of metrics. The notion that what you get, uh, that you get what you pay for, is not up for debate. That is, bonus schemes will signal to managers what they should pay attention to and what they should deliver. And if a firm doesn't have the systems in place to distinguish those that genuinely contribute value to the business, then they'll continue to reward what they can count rather than what counts. I believe that understanding subjective, that subjective assessments can be configured in a way that is contractual and underpinned by clarity and credibility rather than riddled with bias is helpful in resolving the thorny problem of performance measurement and reward. And we really just have to, to, to find a way uh, to get the best out of systems that draw on both objective data and inform subjectivity without crippling bureaucracy. 
Finding that middle ground is potentially more rewarding than the search for more complete and comprehensive hard metrics. So I'll finish on that note. Thank you for engaging tonight. I'm sorry that we can't continue the conversation over canapes, but I do look forward to your questions uh, and I'm happy to deal with questions over email uh, if we don't get time tonight. Um, and just to finish up, I'm going to quickly moving over to the Q&A. Who can resist a Dilbert cartoon that is right on point? Thank you. Thanks, Anne. Uh, that was that was really great. That was that was fantastic. You, you've really given us a, a lot to think about there. And and on behalf of everyone on the call, um, I'd like to thank you sincerely for uh, letting us into into your world and sharing your thoughts with us. Um, I can see a, 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 you know a lot of appreciative comments on in the chat and in the Q and A there. Um, I'd like to go into Q, a question and, and, and answer now, um, and I'm going to take the prerogative of sort of host prerogative here and ask the first one. Um, you seem to kind of be hinting that the harder metrics are, are, are bad and the subjective me metrics are, are better. Um, where, where's, where's the line there? I, I mean, surely there's some room for hard or more objective metrics. I mean, whether or not it be profit or sales targets, etc. How do you think about that sort of balance? Thanks, Brad. That's a that's a good question. Firstly, I'd just like to um, to, to thank everybody again for engaging. I, and I do apologise for some of the sound issues through the recording, um, which was kind of frustrating. But so I, I apologise for that. Um, yeah. So so this question of kind of the, the the balance between the hard and soft metrics is an interesting one. And it, it was very clear in these firms that the hard metrics were really important. Uh, and you know that they can't you know, people can't get by by just doing the right thing or just being kind of like good people. You know, basically they still have to achieve, uh, you know, the, the both the financial and non-financial kind of uh, outcomes associated with their work. Um, I guess the way I the way I would kind of see it is that by and large the 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 quantitative outcomes were really important and people wouldn't get uh, a really high rating unless they did achieve those objective outcomes. Um, but it was kind of a necessary but not sufficient condition. So they then had to also kind of be able to demonstrate that they were doing all of the right, achieving all the right things on the behavioural front as well. Um, and you know, somebody who had put a lot of effort into, say, institution building, but who didn't achieve their sales targets or something, may, you know, for a period of time, get a, you know, be rewarded for that, um, and maybe not. But uh, you know, the, the point was that it was just they had to get the hard metrics, but they had to do the, get the behaviours as well. So um, you wouldn't, if you just got the behavioural side, you wouldn't get a high rating. If you just got the hard metrics, you wouldn't get a high rating. It was you had to kind of do both. Uh, now there's all. This, it kind of raises another interesting aspect, though, and I think this points to perhaps one of the questions that's come through as well. Um, it varies a bit, of course, with the level of the organisation. Uh, the higher up you go in the organisation, the more uh, important the hard metrics are. Um, and there, we, there were certainly in some cases, particularly in the professional services firm, that at, uh, at the kind of uh, partner level that, you know, revenue targets become pretty important and it's pretty hard to, to do really well uh, without achieving those revenue targets. But at the same time, they were still sensitive to the behavioural issues uh, that needed to be that needed to be uh, controlled as well. And just one other point on that, because I, I think it's interesting, the CEO level, if we go up, Further again, you know, in in organisations, you'd say, well, the buck stops with the CEO. They have to they have to achieve the financial outcomes. Everything else is kind of you know like just icing on the cake. They have to be able to deliver the financials. But there's a there's a fair amount of kind of. Um, uh, I guess there's a, there's a literature evolving that's saying that boards are actually not fulfilling their obligations if they don't take the trouble to actually assess the performance of the CEO properly in terms of how they've gone about their work. If they just effectively outsource the assessment of the CEO to the market um, by relying on objective measures of share prices and so on to assess the CEO, that they're actually uh, not fulfilling their responsibilities. So it's quite interesting that, you know, even at the CEO level, you can see some of this play out. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a very complex trade-off, isn't it? It's a it, it's a fine line to walk. Um, is questions are, are coming through. If I can just pick out a couple, yeah. um, you're also I can see you're also getting some compliments on your Dilbert cartoon. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's a worthwhile place for any uh, annual research lecture to finish, I guess. Question from Peter: Your analysis present, uh, represents a necessary condition for success with reducing the anomalies in bonus outcomes. But the risks of perverse outcomes will nevertheless remain. Do you, do you, what do you think about that? Do you agree? Yeah, look, I think, yeah, I mean, and I, I guess this is what I'm trying to convey in this notion of it being a journey, you know. And these, these firms, I felt, had, uh, um, in different ways, they were all, they were all I, I haven't been able to go into the detail of any particular firm just because of the time limitations tonight, but they've, they've, they did it in quite different ways. But I think they were doing a, they were doing a good job of trying to mitigate this kind of behaviour as much as they could. Now, that's not saying it won't creep in. There, there will definitely be you know, there'll, there'll definitely be examples of it. Um, but I think that it, these, are, these are mechanisms to reduce it. Um, and I think, you know, the, I think that the firms firmly believe that if, they, if, if people are doing the wrong thing, they'll find out about it. You know, they're investing huge resources in information collection about what people are doing in their work. So it's, yeah. mit it's mitigation. It's never going to be complete, you know, elimination. Yeah, yeah. No, it's... That makes perfect sense. Um, got another one from Albie. Um, so did you get a sense across the four settings that organisational performance was enhanced due to the existence of these incentive plans? Uh, yeah, it'd be lovely to know that. Uh, you know, we don't, we don't really get the opportunity to, um, uh, to find that out. I mean, yeah, I, no, I, I, I really don't know, but I guess... What I would say is that you, yeah, we were talking to subordinate managers, like they were managerial level, but they were subordinate managers who were being assessed under these kind of regime, you know, this kind of very subjective regime. Uh, and people, they, they were very supportive of it. Like it wasn't just the supervisory managers, it was, it was the subordinate managers. So to the extent that the firm performance is enhanced by having motivated employees who, uh, who hang around, who stay around, who don't leave the firm, you know, frequently, that, you know, they, they had low turnover, that sort of thing, I think. Um, there was a longevity. You, you felt a sense of kind of longevity and commitment and to, to the extent that those things drive performance. I would anticipate that these firms were, were performing well, but, yeah, we have no uh, basis of comparison, really. Yeah. Okay. okay. And that's, a, that's actually a nice segue into one of the other questions that's sitting there, and that is uh, what insights do you think there might be for the training uh, that companies might do for, you know, not only for performance management but also training for employees to actually take up and, and, and perform under these frameworks or perform under these approaches? Yeah, I think there's a lot of, um, I, I think for, the, for employees, I think there's a lot of work to be done. It's all around that clarity and credibility piece. It's around conveying, I think, through training to employees that uh, what the firm does to actually um, uh, to create a contract out of this, you know, so that if employees don't think that they're just being subjectively assessed, that, you know, that there's potential for favouritism, that it's unreliable, that sort of thing. But it's really the firm has to invest in a lot of information conveyance to employees to actually make them understand, uh, you know, the clarity around the criteria that are going to be used and the credibility with which those subjective assessments are being um, juried and, you know, implemented and juried through the process. Um, so that employees have a sense that they have a contractual relationship with their employer, that they're going to be treated fairly and that they're not just simply being asked to trust them. Yeah, yeah. I think that would be, an, to me, that would be an important part of the training you know, it, for employees if firms were to go down this path. Okay, thank you. Um, another question from Gary. Uh, Any, you know, we, we know that uh, firms that make it into the S&P 500, for example, stay there for a short period of time. 
and something soon goes very wrong, typically. Um, and, you know, Gary, the essence of Gary's question is, what does that tell us, if anything, about internal performance incentives that cause previously successful firms to destroy rather than create value? I mean, is there anything from the performance measurement and management kind of angle that we can do to kind of thwart that consistent cycle? Well, in a sense, I, I would say that's what these firms are doing. I, mean, I, I, I would think that, you know, we saw examples of that kind of, uh, you know, collapse in the banks, you know, when, we, when, when they were exposed, you know, in terms of what was happening. So their failure to do a lot of this sort of stuff, their failure to really be much more careful about the behaviour of their staff to design performance measurement and incentive systems which elicited the right kind of behaviours and attitudes through the firm, I think brought the banks undone. Um, and so that was, you know, a huge reputational damage and, um, and, a, very, and a very costly kind of uh, process of uh, reorientation and a few, a few heads rolled in the process. So I think that's the kind of it. So I think these firms are, in a sense, trying to use their performance measurement practice to um, avoid that those sorts of outcomes by being more cognizant about the kind of behaviours that get you there in the long run, um, the kind of behaviours that leave the firm less exposed to to uh, really significant reputation damage. Because uh, there's no doubt, the, you know, that the reputation damage is very very high when you know when egregious behaviours uh, are discovered and um, hit the press. So there's, a, there's another question from Sarah here, and, and it's to do with the calibration or the, you know, the setting of the contracts and, and, and getting the kind of level and, and, and embeddedness right. And essentially it is, um, you know, she refers to, I, I think, uh, quite poetically, the calibration being the secret source, uh, you know, and, and key to the success. Um, in your experience, if you come across a firm that does not have the, the calibration right, and I guess what happens, as what what does or can happen as a as a consequence? Well, yeah, this is. I I actually think the calibration is less of a secret source than what they think it is. Um, it's interesting, uh, you know. Again, this was you know, restricted by time, so I couldn't really go into this. But I, I, one of the really interesting things that we kind of that came out of the study was the residual biases that remain that the firms are not able to get rid of. Now, I see, as a, as a um, somebody who studies subjectivity and performance measurement, I actually see calibration as another level of subjectivity that's being used uh, in these firms. They see it as a layer of objectivity that's being imposed. So, but, but they are confounding, if you like, consensus and objectivity. So they think that once you've got consensus around ratings, you've got objective ratings. I disagree. Um, and we, one of the firms, one of the four firms, didn't do this particularly well. They didn't have a formal calibration process. They had a kind of a fairly ad hoc moderation by their senior people but it was very much a black box. The other three firms had a much more transparent process. The one that had a black box, yeah, that a lot of the, the staff would say, we have no idea what happens in that room. We, we have no, we have really, uh, we kind of trust it in the end because I trust my supervisor, but we're not, we really have no idea much of what happens. So the transparency was critical. Um, but we still found people say things like, you know, uh, calibration has really worked against me because I made one mistake for a manager, you know, not my own manager, but somebody else I worked with two years ago and, you know, he won't let it go. So every time it goes to calibration, it comes up. And now I'm not working with that manager day in, day out, and yet he has a powerful voice in that calibration process. Um, you know, we found other people talked about the power of kind of, you know, of loud voices and, you know, some supervisors are really prepared to get in there and kind of argue hard for their people and others don't. And, you know, the choice to not say something at calibration, it, you know, can mean a difference in rating for someone, you know, all that sort of thing. So there's a lot to study there and there's a lot of uh, dynamics, I think, in the calibration process that actually don't 
really suggest that it's the secret source that they think it is. Okay, it's, look, it's really interesting stuff, Anne, and, and I suspect we could chit-chat for quite some time uh, about some of these issues. So, however, unfortunately, uh, we're nearing the end of the evening. There's, there's a few questions uh, still outstanding. I'll get, to, I'll get to that in a minute. But again, Anne, uh, on behalf of everyone on the call and, and those not on the call but who will uh, access this later, Sincere thanks to you. Uh, we're better off for having shared your thoughts on this uh, and we're very, very grateful. Um, a couple of housekeeping matters uh, before I, uh, you know, organise or, or facilitate the closing of the evening. So some questions in the chat room have asked about accessing the links and the slides, etc. So CPA in the coming days will send an email with a link to the speech uh, as well as in in, in time, uh, the, the questions that were raised and Anne's comments on each of those questions. So there will be a link and it will come to you uh, via your email. Um, and so in order to close the evening, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, CPA State President Jaquetta Griggs, and she's going to um, share some comments and officially close the evening. Over to you, Jaquetta. On behalf of CPA Australia and the University of Melbourne, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. CPA Australia has a membership base of over 168,000 members in over 100 countries. And it is through trusted relationships that we develop as business professionals with tomorrow's capabilities. Today marked the 82nd CPA Australia and University of Melbourne annual research lecture. Acknowledged as the longest running continuous research lecture series, it is with much appreciation to both CPA Australia and the University of Melbourne that we are able again to continue the series virtually in 2021. Performance measurement is something that we have all encountered in our working careers. And it was an absolute privilege to hear from Anne Lillis today presenting on the thorny problem of performance measurement. I thank you, Anne, for providing perspective in regard to the importance of balancing objective performance measures and the consideration of informed subjectivity in the process of performance measurement. And for me, reminding us to reward what counts, not what you can count. Thank you again for joining us today, and I look forward to seeing you again in 2022.